Batman is doing what he does uh, out of, in a lot of ways, kind of vengeance and, and mourning his parents' deaths. Mm -hmm. Nightwing does what he does to celebrate his parents' lives. Yeah. He's a born performer. Uh, you going to the Golden Corral? No, Applebee's. Oh, <laughs> man, you're subverting expectations of some of the viewers. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Sorry, Jason. <laughs> so... Lately, you know, been talking to, to my good friend Eric Breen about some various topics. Today we're going to talk about what I would say is, is going to be a notorious image in the latest edition of Avengers from Jason Aaron, issue number 42, and it is the Phoenix-infused She-Hulk. I don't know, Kim. We'll, I was going to make a joke, but I could get in trouble with that one. We'll take a, a gander at that character, and then we'll dive into a little bit of, of uh, Eric's thoughts and... Uh, we'll, we'll have a deeper conversation. We always seem to do that, Eric. Obviously, with me is the man so cool. They call him the Breen. Eric Breen, how you doing? Still recovering from that image we're about to see again. <laughs> well, I'm still recovering from the game today. My neck is all jacked up from cringing at all the hits that Patrick Mahomes was taking. The worst one was when he was he actually threw the dart into the guy's helmet in the end zone, and he didn't catch it. He was, uh, so, needless to say, I did pull a groin and a neck muscle because of the Super Bowl today. But I am healing. I will endeavor to survive and continue to deliver world-class comic book entertainment right here on Thing Critical YouTube. And if you enjoy stuff like that, I will say this. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoy this. Give us a thumbs down if you don't. Either way, we want to hear your thoughts on this She-Hulk image from Avengers 42. And, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on what we think about it? We want to have a conversation about this stuff. But let's get right to it. Let's look at this image. Now, we know that She-Hulk, who was saved by John Byrne back in the day, has not had the greatest luck lately as far as creators, the way that they have depicted her. But this feels like, is this an all-time low? Because I remember there was the, the picture of She-Hulk from behind, and it she was looked like she was about to, um, I don't know, what's the word, assault a man in a jacuzzi or some type of water bath. If you're asking if this one tops free to be ugly, I'm going to say yes. This is not a woman in any way, shape, or form. It's What's interesting, this is supposed to be like She-Hulk, Phoenix Force She-Hulk, but it looks like Colossus Force She-Hulk. You know, when I first saw the image, I thought it was Amadeus Cho. Because I just, okay. I just glanced at it and... Yeah, the hair pulled back like he was wearing it. And obviously there are no breasts to indicate that that's a woman. And then I, I looked at the face a little closer. And if you know, if you hold a magnifying glass to it, you might be able to Kevin Bacon your way to that being a woman's face. I don't get it myself. So obviously the Phoenix Force isn't something new in Marvel Comics. Phoenix Force has had a few hosts over the years. I don't remember the Phoenix Force ever doing this to another character. No, and I, I'm one of the people that believes that the Phoenix Force should have been retired in X Men 136 or whatever the penultimate issue of that storyline was, because as I said you bring it back again and again for plot points and events. Once you run out of ideas on what to do with it, like A versus X eight, eight years ago was a stretch. I, I don't know what this is. Well, I'm uh, just waiting for the Phoenix Force to take over the eight-year-old Moon Girl, and you know I'm not sure what she's going to look like, but I'm sure she's going to tear a new one into some people. It's just it's just such a weird concept for a story. I've already gone into details on why the previous issue sucked so bad. We're not going to get into the the deets as far as Avengers 42. If you want to go see a train wreck, go check it out for yourself. But this image here is horrendous. Whoever at Marvel greenlit this probably deserves to be fired. And Green lit. Yeah. I see what you did there. <laughs> how, did, is there a, how did this happen to She-Hulk? She was such a, a well-crafted character that had very dis, there was huge distinctions between her and the regular Hulk. But I guess somehow it was offensive that the that the female version of Hulk was like more human. She was just green and she wasn't grotesque looking. The interest of of fairness, I guess she had to become gross and disgusting, and in this case, even more disgusting than Bruce Banner Hulk. Well, She-Hulk 
the the original concept, or I should say, the the what she morphed into, because the original concept was basically, I mean, yeah, she was attractive, but she was always angry. She was, you know, so that that part of her personality was basically, you know, the the culmination of like of, of her of Jennifer Walters' rage, but they evolved her into a really fun, sexy character because that that original concept failed the it the book lasted 25 issues and then my head canon it starts with john Byrne because well, i yeah, learned well, that from you my friend well uh, okay but i'm going to take you back a little farther they used her in a t in a marvel two and one that kind of bridged the gap between savage she hulk and what would end up becoming sensational she hulk and then they put her in the avengers she thrived there when Byrne wanted to you know give the thing his own title he, that's when he first put yeah, you know, She Hulk into the Fantastic Four. So he had written her for a couple dozen issues before the solo series, and he kind of formed that personality. It was between that and the sensational She Hulk, where they came up with the idea of breaking the fourth wall and all the other tropes that, that made that book such a fun read. But what she had become was the antithesis of what modern comic book creators want in their characters. And for whatever reason, the fact that she was unapologetically sexy, kind of an exhibitionist, she just had fun. And that was the real Jennifer Walters. She just, you know, the She-Hulk just brought out who she wanted to be. And in modern comics, that that the old buzzword problematic. So little by little, they took away her femininity, they took away her personality. And they and they just, like I said, J Jason Aaron you know, kind of tied it up in a bow when he had her look into the camera and say, I'm now free to be ugly. The other idea falls more in line with what Bruce Banner Hulk essentially is. It was He wouldn't be this gigantic monster if he hadn't gone through all this trauma as a child. And the, the gamma rays kind of release the inner beast inside of him. She doesn't have that. You know, she feels sexy and empowered inside of her. So that release that and, you know, magnify that part of her personality and just to, to create her as this weird carbon co carbon copy of old well, second rate carbon copy of Bruce Banner just sucks. Female characters when when they you know are beautiful on top of being powerful that seems to be that that doesn't seem to work for you know modern creators certainly not at Marvel. I mean they've kind of done that to a lot they've done that to a lot of their characters. And yeah, you know, she she Hulk is yeah. You know, what they've turned her into is unrecognizable, unreadable. And, and the only people the 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 fans that come to her defense because I I saw where that Star Wars girl took that picture and made another version of it, basically gave her a chest, and she got a comment from someone that called her, you know, a not C, and, and among some expletives for daring to do that. It's like. So it's like this weird collectivism forms around defending the She-Hulk, no matter how far they get her away from the original idea. And I, I don't know, like I said, I, I can't get inside their heads, so I don't understand why that's preferable to anybody other over the burn version or what other writers that, that you know, patterned her after him. Because like, like even the Dan Slott version of She-Hulk was a fun, sexy character. And a much better run than anything that's you know, with argument. Well, the, the, I take that back. The run after that, that Peter David wrote a lot of, but after, say Siege, yeah, you know, all new, all Marvel She Hulk has just continued to get you know, less and less interesting, and certainly less and less uh, you know, female. It, it's interesting. This this isn't the only example. This is just the latest example of these. Big scale character changes where they're just trying to force things down your throat. Well, I just did the the spoilers for Infinite Frontier number zero. I got a lot of feedback on that one. A lot of longtime fans aren't happy with some of the changes that they're making. I imagine, were you excited for Infinite Frontier number zero? Were those changes that you could get behind? Well, yeah, as we spoke off stage, it's not that I'm not excited. It's just I. There's only there's only so many times I can break in a new universe, and there there will be things that you know I will 
be drawn to. And I do trust DC far more than I trust Marvel in spite of all the upheaval they've had in the last six or eight months. Uh, Future State, I've actually found more that I that I enjoyed out of that than I expected to. So there, you know, there will be things in Infinite Frontier that that I do that I, that I will like, and there'll be some things I don't. I know that's a you know very vague answer, but yeah, you know, I, I trust them to do it better than I would trust Marvel trying to do the same thing. Yeah, you can't you can't trust Marvel with anything. They dropped the ball on X Men somehow. The, the most exciting relaunch you know in comics in the last five ten years and they dropped the ball in a matter of months we just talked about that on the channel so i don't know but well we've talked about this before like you've talked about you feel like maybe are you aging out of, of the hobby do you think it's because you you just your interest in the characters is, is waning or do you is it do you think it has more to do with the quality itself is waning to the degree that you don't feel like you should have to subject yourself to second rate third rate creatives I guess I'm going to answer that with an analogy. If baseball has always been my my favorite, you know, hobby, even more than comics, but baseball has become little more than home runs and strikeouts because everybody everybody can throw 99 plus now, and everybody's concerned with launch angles and exit velo and all that BS. But there are still moments where the game reminds me of why I love it so much. Juxtapose that with comics. Um, you know, it's never going to be as good for me as it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even in the early 2000s, and throw in a little bit of the 90s. But there are still those moments that remind me of why I've been in this hobby since 1975. There just aren't as much of them as there used to be. And part of that is, I don't care how hard you try to fight it, you get older, your, your, your tastes change, your sensibilities change, and, uh, you know, one of my old lines was, I got tired of paying $4 for five minutes of entertainment that was going to you know, piss me off six ways to Sunday. I'm just not going to do that anymore. So now I'm going to pick and choose what I read. But there will, you know, there'll always be stuff out there. It's just harder to find it. Yeah. And, I, and a lot of people my age probably feel the same way. It's not just your age, my friend. I've I've get I get that feedback from a lot of people, and I'm getting I'm even getting that from people in their twenties and thirties. Like one of my my very good friends from the Navy, when I when I told him I was starting my channel, I was like, "Hey, I'd love you to come on and talk about comic books." I stopped reading comics three years ago. I was like, "That's all you talked about at work for two years straight." He's like, "No, I just read manga now." There you go. And that should concern the industry because I, you, if people in their twenties are are finding you know a lot in this industry not to their liking it, they shouldn't maybe maybe be overly concerned with what i'm thinking but they've technically they've got you know decades with their younger audience and they've got to find a way to reach them and I, the, the approach they're taking i said it, it's it, it seems like they've done you know so much to shrink the readership and I don't know if, the, if their goal was to do that, but if it was, they seem to have succeeded. But there's got to be a way to expand it again at some point. It's like they, I mean, I, I know what would do that. The industry will never do that. You know, what's interesting is actually, if you look at the numbers, the industry is expanding. Those 20-something readers are are graduating from those scholastic books into graphic novels and, and, and comic books. It's just not DC and Marvel. They're going and reading manga. They're going and reading, you know, some of the the adult graphic novels that are, that are in, in bookstores because somehow DC and Marvel have dropped the ball. And you say, you know, what, maybe I'm aging out. No, no, we're all aging out because of of the low quality that they're putting out there. And it's it it it's across the board. It transcends uh, demographics as far as uh, race and, and age, and uh, and religions and things like that. People want to read and pay for good entertainment until dc and marvel start providing that at a reasonable clip which i don't personally believe that they are at this moment they're going to keep exiting and going and finding their entertainment elsewhere because they do have alternatives they have manga they, they have adult graphic novels there is an entire selection of comic books that are competing with them and they are slaughtering them at the moment 
Well, when I when I think of comics, I, I I'm kind of like by default, I'm thinking of the big two. Mm -hmm. Because that's <laughs> and, what comics were yeah. for such a very long time. But that's not what comics are anymore. Because no, you're right. DC and Marvel opened the door when they they, they started pushing agenda over quality. When they started, uh, you know, lowering the the threshold of what constituted a good story. When they started oversaturating the market with variant covers and events and all these stupid schemes, and they opened that door. Scholastic, you know, decided to create a niche market. It's blown up in Marvel and DC's faces, and essentially has overtaken them. Manga came over through the back door and has blown up in their faces, and they can't keep up anymore. Well, yeah, and. The way Marvel and DC do things now, they said they they've kind of chased away a lot of the older readership, and the, the readers that they've picked up, they're not giving them a reason to remain loyal to these characters, you know, for the rest of their you know reading lives. Because who are these characters? I mean, they, you why know, they, should you or I remain loyal to these characters when the companies don't care enough to do it? And that's 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 my point. I, you know, if you if you started you know, reading comics a couple years ago, the versions of these characters you're getting, they're they're not really. There's nothing about the way they're being. Most of them are being presented now that make you want to stick with them for the long haul. It's, I'd say again, more so at Marvel than DC, because I, mean, I can pick up a DC and still recognize the characters I'm reading there. Some of these Marvels, I, I can't. I say, yeah, I, I, I just don't, you know, they, they're not even reasonable facsimiles of what I read for decades. And, and that would be, that, that would be fine if what they'd morphed into was something that an, a new generation of reader would get a hold of and say, I'm going to remain loyal to these characters. Give me more, but it's not happening. So no, they're, they're they morphed into either. this weird abomination version of She-Hulk. And weird abomination versions of the other characters that are certain to keep driving fans away as they finally give up and say, you know what, maybe there just isn't any hope. I think there is hope. I know you believe that there is hope. I'm re ready for a brighter day. I'm sticking around, but I can't convince everybody to stick around with me, you know? Yeah, well. Like I said, you know, I, I'm I am a lifer. I mean, you know, 45 years if I if they haven't gotten rid of me yet. They're not. They're probably not going to. And and even if they do, like I said there's a rich history to fall back on, and that's another thing. I said the way these characters are being presented today, anybody that goes, if you if you've totally embraced the new like Marvel, you're probably not going to have any interest in going back. So it's kind of like it's almost like there's two different audiences now. For you know, there's the past and there's the present. And there's finding a hard way to connect the two with the readers well, that they're attracting. There are two different audiences. There's your your normal audience that comes in and they, they got a pull list, or maybe they go into their comic shop once a month and pick up all the comics that they want to read. Then you have the other audience that's out there calling us a bunch of idiots that go and they pirate comics and, and share them, share file share and stuff like that. And then you know they, they sit there and crap on people. For some reason, Marvel and DC have sided with that audience rather than the people that are willing to go in there and make the trek every single week, the pilgrimage down to the local comic shop and throw some shekels down and buy some comic books and pay for their entertainment. I'll never understand it. Well, it's it's kind of like at this point, the you know, big business, tech, whatever, they've sided with that side. And if you don't fall in line, you know, it, it can blow back on you. It's, uh, they, it's almost like if... All it would take would be if one of the two companies said, no, we're going to listen to the actual fans and not not the pirates, not Twitter, not the you know, people that call everybody names when they dare to have a problem with that image of She-Hulk. And then find out if the world doesn't come to an end, maybe others would follow suit. But right now there's so much pressure to be part of that group that controls everything right now. That I yeah I, I don't want to say I don't I don't blame the and then you also have to remember the people making those decisions the, the higher ups of these companies that's what they believe you know well, maybe they're also they scared. <clears throat> a lot of them are scared to death 
I mean, because I, you, you know, can get fired if you get the, the mob on your ass. Right. And that's, I, I kind of use an example. Axel Alonso, I thought, ran Marvel into the ground. He's doing fantastic over it. A, 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 a AWA upshot or whatever it's called. And maybe that's because <clears throat> he doesn't have Disney's deep pockets anymore. He knows he's got to produce to stay in business. Yeah, and the, the head of that company might have been the biggest clown car Marvel that ever drove through Marvel and Bill Jamas. But the two of them are, are probably producing the consistently best comics, you know, you know, per output, maybe in the business right now. So, yeah. I mean, it can be done. It's crazy. I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll never understand it. We're, we continue to get weird abomination versions of characters like we did this week with She-Hulk in Avengers. Yeah, in Avengers during this Phoenix Force tournament. We've just gotten the the new Thor's mom origin in this thing. We, it's just been a train wreck. But this is what what you know, Avengers. This is supposed to be a tent bowl, tent pole property for DC, for for Marvel Comics, and it's it's a train wreck right now. Just like most of Marvel is. It shouldn't feel. This is what I'll, I'll leave you with, Reed. It shouldn't feel special when I get an issue of Chip Zdarsky's Daredevil, just because I know the character is going to feel like Daredevil. And it does feel special right now because it's a, it's an anomaly when I get a good comic book that I know is going to be true to the character. I know exactly how you feel. I've actually read the last five Amazing Spider-Mans. And my comment, my, my take on it was you could take those issues and drop them off almost anywhere in the past of that character and they would fit. And once upon a time, there were dozens of, of books like that coming out from both companies every month. And now uh, we're you know, seeing the praises of two Marvel titles out of how many? Now, to be fair, I'm not reading King and Black. I understand that you know, people are liking that. But you know, it, it's, it, it used to not be a struggle to come up with a top five Marvel titles for any given month. Yeah, and you probably wouldn't have to include the event series in it. Yeah. 